The Book of the Book of the American Pit Bull Terrier Richard F. Stratton Chapter 1 A Sheep in Wolf's Clothing One of the perfalls to communication lies in that little phrase, it's obvious. What is obvious to A, alas, is by no means obvious to B and is downright ludicrous to C. In 1976 my book This is the American Pit Bull Terrier was published. While to me it seemed an innocuous little book on a much maligned breed, it had the impact of an artillery shell on the dog world generally. While many hailed the book as a breath of fresh air, groups were formed with the express purpose of debunking it. Among a large group of people I was automatically branded a dog fighter. The book was quoted in a number of Sunday supplement articles on either dog fighting generally or the breed specifically. I was ready to debate and print anyone who wanted to challenge any of the premises of the book, but there were few challenges. Most critical comment was placed furtively in private club bulletins, and I was not sent copies. Oh, well, at least the book was noticed. Since I plan to go into even more detail about dogfighting than I did in the previous book, it might be in order for me to tell something about myself and my attitudes on a variety of subjects. After all, I can see how people would think that in order to know so much about dogfighting, I would have to be a dogfighter. On the other hand, there is an overabundance of critics who are perfectly content to label anyone a dog fighter on the flimsiest of evidence. Ownership of an American pit bull terrier, or even a staff or bull terrier, for that matter, will suffice. Some of what I have to say about myself would hardly come under the category of bragging. For example, when I was five years old I remember how chagrined my father was when a playmate of mine, a girl, killed a butterfly and I promptly burst into tears. We lived in the mountains then in a tough mining community and such compassion was certainly considered unmanly even on the part of a young boy. For that matter, I can remember all through my childhood a number of times that my peers confided in me that I was. Chicken-hearted, i.e., I had too much compassion for animals. My father had to teach me to fight, as I was undersized and was a pacifist by nature. From my earliest years I loved all animals in general and dogs in particular. My father had always talked about his boyhood dog, a collie named Jack. Jack apparently led a legendary life, whipping a sundry of dogs, throwing a bull I would have thought it was my father that was, throwing the bull, but Jack's exploits were also talked about by others, and defending my father and his sister from threats from strangers, real and imagined. Natural L.Y., I wanted a collie, too, and I was eventually to have three of them. In the meantime I read all the Albert Pace and Terhune stories on dogs, nearly always collies who, like Jack, led heroic lives. I read those stories so much I wanted to be a collie when I grew up. Unfortunately none of my collies, nor any of the others I knew, for I was now a regular at the dog shows, ever approached the legendary prowess of either my father's or Terhune's collies. I began to look around. I took a serious interest in a variety of breeds before I finally discovered the pit bull. A veterinarian who was showing a boxer at a dog show told me about the American Bull Terriers. He said that they could whip any breed of dog and confessed that they were his favorite. When I was 13 years old, I used money I had earned on a paper route to send to Lewis B. Colby in New Hampshire for my first pit bull pup. Later, living in Colorado, I became acquainted with W.R. Leitner, one of the all-time great breeders. It was through him that I got to know other devotees of the breed in Colorado. None of these fellows were into matching dogs for money, 
at least not on a regular basis. However, I saw numerous roles in which the dogs were put down with no money at stake. In none of these roles did I see anything that I could conceivably consider cruel. The dogs quite simply appeared to be having a marvelous time doing what they were bred to do something akin to a fine athlete participating in his favorite sport. True, the dogs were banged up afterwards, but they recovered quickly and seemed to suffer very little during their period of recuperation. They were obviously amazing animals, bred to dish it out and take it too. It was not until I entered into military service that I began to see bona fide contract moneyed matches. I saw hundreds of matches during this time and I met dog people from all over the country. I met a variety of dog men and they were especially open and helpful to me. It was in this way that I developed the contacts that enabled me to have the knowledge of the breed that is normally privy to dog fighters. Thus, I was able to speak with the authority of a bona fide pit dog man. I had helped school dogs and I had helped some of the finest conditioners of all time train their charges for a match. Well, then, does that mean I am willing to condemn dogfighting now as a cruel and barbarous sport? Sorry, but I don't have the hypocrisy to do that. To be perfectly candid, there is nothing cruel about pit fights. The cruelty of dogfighting exists only in the minds of those who know nothing about it. And, incidentally, isn't that why dogfighting is IL legal? Because the laws were passed by people who know nothing about it. Well, of course, there are going to be many people who feel that they know a priori that dogfighting is cruel or that by its very nature the activity is cruel. Well, perhaps, but I don't think so. Then the solution is that I am a calloused person, right? Again, perhaps that is true, but you would have trouble convincing people who know me that this is the case. I am almost ashamed to admit the deepness of the empathy that I have for animals and people too. I am unable to enjoy hunting or fishing much to the chagrin of my youngest son who earns his summer money working on a sport fishing boat. I donated funds to stop the killing of baby seals and I have actually been a member of the Humane Society. I am currently a science teacher and I am especially interested in biology. I am a Shakespearean buff and spend my evenings usually reading a variety of material. Articles I have written on various fishes have been indexed in the zoological record and biological abstracts. I am a strong chess player. I love classical music, opera, and ballet. I am a member of the San Diego Zoological Society. I have been an assistant college wrestling coach and I have been a teacher at nearly all levels. At the age of 48 I jog regularly and am an avid tennis player. To be perfectly candid, I have been bored silly writing these things about myself. I hope I haven't bored you too. I felt, however, that it was important for readers to know something of my interests and of the kind of person I am in order to evaluate my opinions and the validity of my information. To sum up, 1. I am not a dog fighter, an inaccurate term really nobody fights their dogs some allow them to fight, although I have a fair knowledge of every aspect of the APBT, 2. I am generally known as a gentle person, both with animals and people, 3. I enjoy scholarly subjects and pursuits, but, 4. I am athletically oriented to, 5. I love all animals and I vigorously oppose their neglect or any senseless cruelty imposed upon them, 6. I do not consider dogfighting, with pit bulldogs. Cruel. It's possible, I suppose, that dogfighting is just a blind spot with me. However, isn't it more likely that its detractors simply don't know what they're talking about? 
Chapter 2 The Charms of the Savage Beast In view of the fact that I do not match dogs myself, there must be at least a few people who wonder why I put my neck on the line for dog fighters. A possible explanation could be that I am concerned that the matching of dogs will be stamped out. This would signify the end of the breed as we know it. The American Pit Bull Terrier would become another American Staffordshire Terrier and the thought of that is truly repugnant to me. However, it is my view that the fanaticism of pit dog men is such that dogfighting would continue even if it were made a hanging offense. For that reason I have little worry about the extinction of the breed. The real impetus behind my writings is my impatience with ignorance and its promulgation. And phenomenal ignorance abounds about dogfighting as a sport and about the breed that dominates it. The very fact that there exist any fanciers of the breed at all would be remarkable. The fact that rabid fanciers exist in great quantity is nothing short of astounding. Just consider the fact that anyone owning a bulldog is automatically a suspected dog fighter, an automatic pariah in normal society. Surely that's like asking to be ugly. Obviously, there is something very special about bulldogs to inspire such nearly irrational devotion. Such dedication has not been restricted to morons and misfits, as some groups would like to have you think. Most people would be surprised at the caliber of the average American pit bull terrier fancier. Further, there has been no lacking of illustrious persons who have been devotees of the breed. John L. Sullivan not only raised the dogs, but he also wrote occasional articles about them. The Armitage book mentions Jack Dempsey's interest in the dogs and there are several pictures of Dempsey with several different dogs. Several modern pro football stars raised the breed and some of them have been to my home. Lest the reader be left with the impression that only athletes respond to the breed, let me hasten to add the names of Thomas Edison, Theodore Roosevelt and Senator Everett Dirksen to the list of those who were smitten by the charms of the so-called savage pit bull. In addition, I know a number of physicians, attorneys and research scientists who are true dyed-in-the-wool fans of the American Pit Bull Terrier. Some raise the breed and some only keep one at a time. The point is that they all respond to something in the bulldog that they are unable to find in any other breed. One of the things that is mentioned so often is the lift that one gets just from being around a bulldog. Something about their natural enthusiasm and zest for life is obviously contagious. Strange as it may seem, one of the most engaging traits of the breed is its gentle disposition. I suppose one of the things that makes the good disposition appreciated so much is the knowledge we all have that the bulldog asleep in our lap is the same dog that would fearlessly attack a bear or a lion and give him all he could handle. I have discussed elsewhere the attributes of the breed. To sum them up they are prodigious strength, agility, an unusually stable disposition, intelligence, a comic personality, a quiet nature, quieter, in fact, than the Basenji, and, of course, unbelievable fighting ability. Undoubtedly there will be many who will quite naturally be skeptical about some of these traits, as exaggerated claims are made by devotees of nearly all breeds. Perhaps knowing the origins of these traits may make them a little more believable. Of course not all pit bulls have all the traits mentioned above. Some pit bulls may be barky and others may be stupid ID, but generally speaking the above-mentioned traits are typical of pit bulls. One of the hardest attributes for many uninformed persons to accept is the good nature and stable temperament of the breed. However, it is easy to see how such a trait has evolved by the simple elimination of the dogs that didn't have it. 
Take into consideration, for example, the fact that in the pit the dogs have to be handled and ministered to many times in the course of a typical match. How much more difficult things would be if the dogs out of pain, fear, savagery, or whatever, would be inclined to bite their handlers. For that matter, a dog that scratched to the referee instead of to the other dog would be a definite liability. Dogs that did not stay cool under pressure and make a definite discrimination between human and other animals were, therefore, systematically weeded out. Of course an occasional man-fighter will turn up, but it is only the novices that will normally tolerate them. At a meeting that included some of the most knowledgeable pit dog men in the country, there was a general consensus formed that the pit bull, if so inclined, was perfectly capable of killing a grown man. When asked about the pit bull as a danger to humans I usually say that the pit bull is a thousand times less likely to attack a human than any other dog, however, if he does attack, he is a thousand times more dangerous. Just picture a bulldog attacking a full-grown man with the same intensity as he does another dog. He would be impossible to beat off barehanded and he would quite likely bore in, grasp the man in the chest area and then shake. Even if the attack were terminated there, by outside intervention, a man could easily go into shock and die just from that. For that reason most pit bulls sign their own death warrant if they show any signs of aggression to a human. Intelligence, again, is pretty much a matter of natural selection. Dogs that were able to learn tactics and strategy had a decided advantage over those that couldn't. Now we must be sure not to confuse intelligence with tractability. Some breeds, such as herding dogs, are specifically bred for tractability the instantaneous obedience to commands given by voice, whistle or hand signals. Scott and Fuller, 1965, however, found that one reason herding dogs did poorly in certain problem-solving tests was that they seemed to waste time standing around waiting for instructions or help. Hounds, on the other hand, which are not generally known for being tractable, scored quite well on the tests. With the bulldog, however, we can have our cake and eat it, too, for the breed is reasonably tractable and has an abundance of intelligence. Once a poor misguided soul stated the bulldog brain was smaller than that of other dogs. Well, first of all, that just isn't true. The brain might seem small in big head dogs compared to the size of the head, but the important thing is the brain body size ratio, and on this basis the bulldog has a larger than average brain. Even if that were not the case, we must remember that brain size alone is not all that significant. Einstein's brain, for example, was a verage sized. One of the largest brains on record was that of an idiot. The enthusiasm that the breed is noted for probably stems from two selective pressures. Other things being equal, a dog that would work well and actually enjoy training during a keep would come into the pit in the best condition. Also, a dog that enjoys fighting and has an absolute passion for it is more likely to be a pit winner and thus be selected for breed ING. This enthusiasm spills over into other areas and thus the bulldog has a happy-go-lucky enthusiastic approach to just about everything in life. This enthusiasm helps account for his comic and sometimes roguish personality. On the other hand, since many pit dog men were city dwellers, it was advantageous to have a dog that was not so hyperactive that he could not tolerate being chained up or kenneled and left alone for extended periods. In the same situation a barking dog would be a decided disadvantage. Not only would it draw the ire of neighbors, but it would also draw attention to the type of dogs our pit dog man was keeping. Contrary to general opinion, 
the general public of olden times was no more tolerant of matching dogs than is modern society. Strength and agility are obviously an asset in combat, so dogs with these characteristics would automatically be selected. A certain indestructibility was also a valuable asset that quite naturally evolved. No matter how strong or indestructible a dog was, however, if he lost interest or gave up in a fight he would naturally lose the contest and not be bred. Thus, gameness became an important quality. Gameness is actually an oversimplification that involves a variety of traits, mainly enthusiasm for fighting contact, winning or losing, endurance, resistance to shock and the ability to tolerate pain. This ability to tolerate pain has been thought by some to be a degeneration of the nervous system, of the pain sensors. I think a more logical explanation is that the bulldog has developed a mechanism, or mechanisms, for overriding pain in a combative type situation. Although a bulldog seems to have more grit than other breeds to resist pain in most situations, he obviously does feel pain and will yelp when stepped on just like other breeds. One reason some people think they don't feel pain is that they are so easily ministered to when injured. I think this attribute is the result of a selective process also. The dogs that could be quietly ministered to or even cooperate in their treatment were more likely to survive, and thus more likely to be bred. If a dog is subjected to a particularly punishing hold and batley, it will usually devise a defense to prevent the other dog from getting the same hold, the dog obviously feels something, although undeniably not as intensely as many other breeds. Recent studies have been done that indicate that higher organisms, including humans, have developed mechanisms for overriding pain under stress. Some substances referred to as endomorphines, or endorphins, have been isolated. I would suggest that the bulldog would be an ideal subject for studies involving the production of these substances. I have a feeling the breed excels above all other creatures in its production. At this point let us back up for a moment and take a look at all breeds and at the dog as a species. In this way we can view the American Pit Bull Terrier in perspective. First, the SPECs. Most biologists believe that all breeds of dog are descended from the wolf. It used to be thought that the dog was an amalgamation of various wild dog species, but this theory has been largely abandoned. Some might still argue that the dog and wolf come from a common ancestor, but as I said the prevailing opinion is that we all have in our homes various wolves in all different sizes, colors, and specialized attires. Some breeds are more wolf-like than others, both in appearance and behavior. That difference is explained by the history of domestication rather than by origin. The bulldog, ironically, seems to be one of those breeds that have been civilized for a relatively long period of time. Conversely, the sled dogs are examples of a wolf-like dog. In their case not only were they evolved more recently from the wolf, but they also have been interbred with wolves, even in recent times. The wolf, then, is a predatory animal that specializes in capturing its prey by running it down. It has outstanding endurance and toughness. The species has excellent sensory CA capabilities, especially auditory and olfactory, and it is a fairly intelligent animal. The wolf is exceeded in intelligence, though, by a number of animals, including seals, elephants, dolphins and most of the primates. The wolf was an exceedingly successful species but is being driven to extinction now, as are so many species, by the cancerous growth of human population. Now let us look at our wolf descendants, our various breeds of dogs. 
A good point to keep in mind here is that most breeds are show breeds. That is, they have been bred for many thousands of generations strictly for appearance. Anything else you get will be strictly coincidental. Of course most breeds have a lot of pap written about their usefulness at various activities, but these are mostly fanciful AC counts, as are their official histories. With the performance breeds there is more variety in appearance. They are bred for what they can do rather than for a specific type of ear, head, color, size, and so on. Examples of performance breeds are herding dogs, border collies and kelpies mostly, hunting dogs, bird dogs, spaniels, hounds and retrievers, guide dogs, strains of German shepherds and Labrador retrievers are mostly used for this, fighting dogs, tosas in Japan, chindus in Korea, Neapolitan mastiffs in some areas and the king of them all, the American pit bull terrier and racing dogs. Notice that the various performance breeds take advantage of some aspect of the wolf that is superior to man. For example, the superior scenting abilities are utilized in the bird dogs and hounds to find game. Superior speed and endurance are utilized by the herding dogs. That same endurance added to formidability and toughness has, of course, been amplified in the fighting dogs. All the desirable traits are amplified by selective breeding for whatever activity is our concern. An important point here is that the performance breeds have been bred to love what they do above all other things. A border collie must be watched or he will sneak off and herd the sheep when his services are not needed. A hound would rather hunt than eat. A fighting dog, believe it or not, enjoys fighting contact. So that knocks the cruelty to animals theory into a cocked hat. Like other performance breeds the American Pit Bull Terrier is quite variable in size and appearance and like other performance breeds, he is also very highly bred. His great strength and agility make him a natural for a variety of uses to man besides entertainment in fighting exhibitions. All the traits I have described play a part in his great appeal, but let's be honest. Those of us who dote on this breed appreciate its fighting ability. How many of us have picked up in our arms a small bulldog we were walking on a leash when accosted by an unleashed German shepherd? Our concern is not for our little bulldog who is eyeing the shepherd intently as though it were his evening meal. Usually the other owner says something like, Oh, he won't hurt your little dog. We smile grimly and nod patronizingly, but how sweet is that inner smugness.